Yeah, what would I need email? This email thing. This is the biggest thing since email. Hello everybody to the new year 2023. I have a special guest to introduce you. It's my pleasure to bring you Joshua Shigala, who is not only an early Bitcoiner, but also an entrepreneur contributing to the space by building very interesting stablecoin protocol. Josh's life story is engaging and interesting and the best person to discuss it with you is Josh himself. <laughs> uh, well, um, I'm one of the those guys in the uh, beginning of, of Bitcoin that uh, was ranting and raving at everyone and no one listened. That, that's basically me. First of all, I've always been fascinated in alternative uh, currencies and alternative economies, I should say. And I built the world's first swap site where people could swap clothes back and forth wow. um, instead of buying and selling. So they would put up, take photos of all their wardrobe and then other people would. And then you say, oh, I really love that jumper. Wow. Do you like anything of my stuff? And then, you you know, you say, oh, yeah, I really love that. And then you trade. The problem with that was that everyone has different value sets for uh -huh. what they've got. Uh, I started actually looking at that stage and that was around 2002, 2003. Wow. You know, this is a good solid uh, six, seven years before before Bitcoin. I didn't want to create a credit system on on SwapStyle. That was the name of the site where you could then swap things and, and have a credit because then I was like, well, then I have to be a central bank. How many do I issue? You know, all the tokenomic stuff that we talk about in crypto now, I was thinking yeah. about like, hang on a minute. Uh, you know, that was six, seven years younger than that video that you saw. I just wanted to reply about Bitcoin. Now, you are totally wrong. You are totally wrong in everything that you say. <laughs> and everybody's so, going to see it very soon. We're going to talk about the video, but please go on. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so, so anyway, I, I started looking. I found what the cypherpunks were doing. You know, I, I just thought it was an unsolvable problem like they did. And the, the problem I'm talking about is the double spend problem. It was unsolvable. Uh, or in, so it was thought, yeah. Considered unsolvable yeah. until, until, and, until Satoshi, until Satoshi. But I, you know, I, one of the things I, you know, I tried to have a dabble and see, you know, I was constantly thinking about it. how can you have a, an asset that was digital and, and everything is always pointed back to some sort of database and how you can share a database without uh, having control over that database. And a lot of the cryptographic stuff came around, it was based around multi-signature. I kept my eye a little bit on it, but sort of mm -hmm. forgot about it. And um, and in 2010, you know, I saw the Satoshi's white paper and I, I just fell off the back of my chair, really. Mm -hmm. I was actually working at a, at a television station and uh, had a lot of GPUs there. I was, he I was head of 3D animation. Wait a and, second. So you have a media background? Yeah. Well, so it happens to be, so do I. And I'm actually still working in a television and on news. Uh, oh, so I did news graphics uh, for a very long time as well. Yeah. I did see your 11 years old video and I'm going to edit it in. Right now, Bitcoins is a very speculative coin. But more and more people are jumping on and saying, well, I'm going to do work for Bitcoin. More and more people are doing work for Bitcoin. It, it's, it's a very early phase uh, currency, you've got to remember. It's not some Ponzi scheme. I mean, Ponzi scheme, it's just the most ridiculous thing to say it's a Ponzi scheme. So the other thing is it jumped up 100% in a couple of days. Oh, it's too inflation, deflationary. It's just trying to find the right value for what it is right now. It's, uh, you know, because no central authority says Bitcoins have this value, boom, like the government does, you know, it starts at a very low value. And just like an auction, electronic pulse bomb, come on. I mean, are you serious? This is a very early days of uh, Bitcoin. You know, already they're writing things for being able to store your Bitcoin wallet in the cloud so that if, uh, you know, if there is an electronic pulse bomb, Jesus, I mean, talk about grasping at straws, it'll, uh, you know, it, it, your Bitcoins are stored in, in, in Europe somewhere or something like that. It's, it's cloud-based and it'll be spread and it'll be encrypted so no one can steal it. Uh, this technology will keep on getting better. Um, now, if, if Bitcoin is the first 
incarnation of this and and someone comes out with a competing currency well it might be might have learnt from bitcoin but trust me bitcoin is sticking around just like BitTorrent has no centralized i mean that's good <laughs> i mean that's the one of the best things ever to to hit currency now cash has been centralized gold has been very almost centralized bitcoin concept is is superior to gold and silver you will have access to it everywhere mobile phones are getting extraordinarily good now you'll be able to just bump someone's mobile and transfer bitcoins bitcoins are also divisible by eight zeros so as it in as it deflates as uh, as it, it becomes more valuable uh, you'll send someone point zero 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 one of a Bitcoin. If if you think it's a scam, well, don't do anything with it. But don't go out there preaching that it's a scam when it's not. It's another currency trying to find its feet. Yeah, I really wanted to to ask you about the story behind the video and how is it even possible that you you discovered Bitcoin this early? Because I'm so, of course I'm very jealous. Um, but <laughs> you've just answered the question. I think that you were looking, you were looking for something like this. You were mm. interested in in the alternative payment system, alternative finance system. How did you come across the white paper? I was subscribed to a few different RSS feeds. Uh huh. And okay. one of the RSS feeds were like this sort of type of people, crypto, freedom of the internet, uh, freedom of uh, discussion and 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 speech and privacy. I just remember seeing the word Bitcoin. Okay. And Bitcoin was so interesting because it allowed to to really understand very quickly what it was if if you kind of knew because of BitTorrent. Uh huh. Yeah. So there was Napster, Bitcoin. right? Um, was uh, a centralized uh, music sharing platform back in the day. It was the okay. very first file sharing platform called Napster and how it worked, you would log into the central server and it would, uh, and you would share your music directory okay. and it would go and look at every single song you've got and say, okay, this IP address has these songs. Okay. And, and then you could say, Hey, um, I want Metallica's, uh, you know, enter Sandman and, and my computer would, uh, would connect to the Napster server. The Napster server would say, hey, uh, you've got that. Dave's got that song. And mm -hmm. it would connect my computer then to your computer. Now it would be peer uh -huh. to peer. Peer to peer, yeah. But, but before that, it was centralized. So mm -hmm. the music industry got really angry. There was big fights about that. It was, um, you know, MP3 was like spawning and, and, uh, and, and basically they took down the Napster server. Oh. So, so, wow. so that then destroyed that whole thing because it was easy to centralize, to, to delete that central uh, hub. What happened very quickly is someone developed BitTorrent. So BitTorrent took the idea that Napster had, but decentralized that database. So now the music industry couldn't stop it. People were sharing files and sharing music and sharing ideas and documents. That that was really what, show, what instantly showed me uh, Bitcoin, okay, I think I know what this is. And that made me yeah. then, of course, read the white paper. And I just thought, wow, this is amazing. So you create a chain of blocks, <laughs> hash them, and put the neck, the hash of that last block. Into, I'm not sure how much your audience knows about how blockchains work. It's, it's the kind of stuff where we all think like, yes, we know, and we know enough. But then when we go deeper into it, we all of us discover that, I didn't understand this works this way. Like we, there is always yeah. something you can learn, even if you yes. know a lot. The issue I'm having is that a lot of people saying, oh, Bitcoin's just for geeks. Well, the thing is that, yeah, it's quite complex. Bitcoin is a transaction recorded on the blockchain, a digital ledger. The blockchain uses cryptographic functions, aka super complex math, to prevent counterfeiting and security breaches. The blockchain is updated by miners, not miners. You've solved the double spend problem by or by having a genesis. So basically a network is paying humans for the first time in the history of mankind mm -hmm. to secure the network. Amazing revelation uh, that, that Satoshi came up with to, to solve that double spend problem. And not only that, 
whenever I send you a coin, what your software does is go, okay, I'm going to check the route to that coin. So it'll go, okay, that coin came from this address, this address got it from this address. Mm -hmm. That's a real legitimate coin. No one just invented it yesterday. And all of this without any central authority, of course. All of this is no. done by the system. All of these rules are rooted in the system, like hard rooted, unchangeable, well, kind of, if you don't fork. So that's yep. uh, that's another property that is very unique and extremely and valuable. No company is, is behind this. No government is behind this. Just people. Yep. That's the yeah. first currency for a very long time. Probably originally currency started from the people, like when, you know, using shells and things. Now, the question that everybody is asking now, I think, including myself. So you've read the white paper in 2010. That was the break point when the Bitcoin start, started being traded on, I think, was it Mount Gox? Was the first ever exchange in 2010 Mount Gox? So that was the first yeah. time when Bitcoin gained like real value before it already had some value in the community that the people were not willing to exchange it for free anymore. But even before that, it had no value. Just a... So uh, when did you actually invest into Bitcoin first time? Would you like to well, talk about that? <laughs> at that stage, it was very, very, very hard to buy Bitcoin. Oh, and... was it? Okay. Yeah, it was almost impossible. It was almost <laughs> impossible. People would try to use PayPal, but very soon in the community, I mean, the community was very small, but mm -hmm. very soon the community realized people would sell their Bitcoin to someone and then then that someone would go onto PayPal and reverse the transaction on PayPal. Oh my and then they would have the Bitcoin and the money, right? The thing is about that time, it was a very, very different time than it is now. People assumed this thing was valuable but they didn't know how valuable really, because it was a super experiment. Like, when's this thing going to die? When's this thing going to crash? Surely someone's going to hack the <laughs> mechanism or that, um, you know, enough miners will get 51% or... Or countries will ban it maybe, yeah. Or, or countries yeah. will ban it. I mean, that, that wasn't the biggest issue because they just didn't take it seriously enough. Yeah, yeah, that's that, why it you know, started growing yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah, even that, it just didn't bother. So... To get the original Bitcoin, you had to buy Second Life credits, which was a game yeah. uh, back then called Second Life. And then you had to jump through another hoop and then get it onto something and then over to... Yeah, it, it was really, really <laughs> tricky. But Mt. Gox made it a lot easier. When I first mm -hmm. uh, read the paper, Bitcoin was at 80, got already to 80 cents. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and the first time I actually started mining some Bitcoin, it was still unprofitable to mine Bitcoin at 80 mm. cents, even oh, though yeah. the, okay. it was only worth 80 cents. And it only put out 50 of these things uh, every 10 minutes. So you would be crunching on these on these CPUs. And, and when I started mining, GPUs mining just started. Um, they okay. uh, Someone in the community figured out how to mine with a GPU rather than the CPU. And so mm -hmm. all the hash rates started going up. I didn't get far with that. And I just liked the philosophy. And back then, really, it was about the philosophy. So, you know, there, there was times where, where I had a lot and times where I had a little. And, you know, I'd spend, I don't know, 10 Bitcoin on a, on a burger once we finally <laughs> got someone at a burger joint to accept Bitcoin, you know. <laughs> so oh, here's 10 Bitcoin, you know. Hey. So, it, you know, the... Everyone thinks that if you got into Bitcoin early, you'd be super mega rich. Oh, now. yeah. But back then, it was very difficult to actually invest in it. First of all, because from the infrastructure point of view that you just explained. But second of all, like uh, nobody, nobody had any idea that it could actually go into unbelievable well, bubbly, uh, let's face it, bubble uh valuations like thousands and tens of thousands you know and so many people were against it too like yeah. um you know the the when silk road opened up which was the first mm -hmm. um drug marketplace that, that that accepted this coin it really caused a massive like disruption in the narrative uh -huh. of what we wanted to build um of course there was people in our and our theme that said great this is fantastic uh, it doesn't yeah. matter because this thing is designed to not be legal. Think of what you may about drugs, but 
the concept that uh, the dread pirate Roberts, who invented uh, the Silk Road, came came up with was, look, um, anarcho-capitalism is the idea of truly free markets um, with with rules dependent on where with which node you go to. So his node, what well, his main rule with the Silk Road was against the non-aggression principle that don't don't aggress against other people. They banned like guns. They they had guns for a little bit, but then they banned it. They banned all of, you know anything else apart from uh, drugs. And on there, they had lots of things like uh, self help on how to uh, get yourself off of drugs. There was. All mm-hmm. sorts of things on that marketplace, but um, you know, as history shows, for anyone who's looked into it, it, it got taken down um, by by the federal police in America, and um, and Ross Ulbricht um, uh, got ta- got got blamed for the whole thing. And you know, he he um, he admitted that he coded the very first version, but uh, but uh, anyway, my, my point was that that in the media's eyes mm-hmm. painted the entire space with a really really negative light. And, you know, what a fantastic headline if you're in the media. Drug marketplace allows anybody to buy any drugs. How terrible. And, you know, what's next? Terrorism. And, you know, um, all of the bad things in the world uh, was thrown at Bitcoin. So if if Bitcoin goes up by double, right, if you bought it at a dollar and it's up at, you know, five (laughs) dollars, what are you going to do? When all the media is shouting how terrible is this thing's got to, you know, it's, it's allowing people to buy drugs, it's got to be shut down. Well, most people, they sold because they've made 5x on their initial investment. Yeah, everybody was saying at $1 yeah, at first. Yes, and I've also read, I went, I made myself the, the pleasure to go into the old Bitcoin forums and I started reading the first, well, of course, the Satoshi's post, but the first discussions about the value of Bitcoin in 2009, 2010. And people will like, like, this could actually have a value someday and that maybe one dollar and then, oh, my God. And then when the game came to one dollar, everybody was selling and on yeah. Mount Gox, right? Yeah, that's right. And and Mount Gox was, um, you know, I, I lost. Uh, so I had a bunch of Bitcoin as well, uh, obviously, from, you know, buying and selling and, and trading and, and doing mm-hmm. our things. And, and there used to be a lot of bounty stuff as well, and and um, and then Mount Gox died in 2014 mm-hmm. um, by by a hack, and and Mark Carpellis, who ran Mount Gox, uh, didn't know what was going on because it was too complex. He he didn't. It wasn't. You know, we talk about transparency with exchanges, but really the transparency it wasn't even transparent enough for him to see through the issues. The early Bitcoiners, they it's not like you just bought you know a whole bunch of it and and held on to now it's probably the most the hardest thing uh, to do yes. most people bought it they either lost it because they didn't take it seriously enough they just had it in a hard drive and mm-hmm. then that got sold or got erased or whatever or a key or you know also back then we didn't have the beautiful seed phrases that you have nowadays the the original bitcoin qt it was called that was the software before it got renamed core Mm-hmm. Uh, QT would only hold a bunch of addresses and you would have to keep backing up. So every time you did a transaction, you have to back up your wallet again. And people didn't and they lost it. That's why, actually, there's a lot of keys that are lost. Um, and uh, people say there's, you know, people say there's millions, millions and millions of Bitcoins lost. You know, I would say maybe three or four million Bitcoin lost, maybe more. And that's why also there we have uh, various metrics such as the realized value. And then we have uh, various charts such as MVRE, which is market value versus real, realized value, because that should presumably account for the lost Bitcoin. That should account for the fact that in real, there is going to be way less millions of Bitcoin in uh, real circulation, because many millions, as you just said, are already lost and some of some will still be lost. Along the way, you also had massive hacks um you know mount gox was of course the the Mm -hmm. pinnacle um of that but you had um uh, you had different exchanges that would uh, there was another exchange uh it was the first leverage exchange i've forgotten what it was called and then there was another uh, service called insta wallet where people could instantly create an address uh, just by having a url and you would just bookmark that page so it was no sign in or anything you just go to your bookmark and there's your wallet 
the the thing is that was also a centralized service and so you had all these centralized services running off with people's bitcoin and then people just got jack of it and just went oh you know what uh i'm tired of this because it was so hard to buy the bitcoins in the first place and then when you uh when it uh finally you know you got hacked it was like oh uh, screw it it's all just too hard but you know the beautiful thing about bitcoin is it's called anti-fragile meaning that every time there's an attack because it's open source anyone can add to the network to try to fix the thing that was attacked so for instance it was very very hard i just mentioned about backing up mm -hmm. right and then the community developed the seed phrase so so that allowed you to basically have one 12 word or 24 word seed and and that would be the the seed of of randomness of entropy that would allow you to generate infinite amounts of addresses and all you had to do was remember that seed and it would regenerate those addresses from that point that that floating point in space time continuum you know one of the other things was when mount gox collapsed and now mm -hmm. we've seen this with ftx mm -hmm. um, mount gox collapsed because there was zero transparency you you got on and, mm -hmm. and you didn't know how liquid so did they FTX. were and so, so did FTX. That's yeah. right. It's Unbelievable. But it happened again now when we all knew that this could happen from Mount Gox. And it happened anyway. And it'll happen again. And it'll happen again. And you know what? We're going to extrapolate this. And I'm sure we're going to get to your to the project you're working on right now, which is also what you have on, a, on your uh, on your hat. Oh, so yeah. It's called the standard.io. But I'm afraid we're going to have to split this because uh, our first part of our of our meeting is running uh, out of time. This is extremely interesting, though. Like there was so much, I think, interesting talk uh, about the early Bitcoin days that I think most of us never heard before. So I think this is extremely interesting. And our today's podcast is worth splitting into two parts. I'm going to release separately. So this is this is how the first this part is, the is going. This is the cliffhanger. This is the cliffhanger moment.